Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're going to get into the third part of the D-Day series by Extra History. I'm guessing this is from the French perspective, but we'll see. Here we go, D-Day, La Resistance, Extra History, Part 3. June 5th, 1944. A group of French farmers huddle around a radio tuned to the London broadcast. If they're caught, they will be thrown in prison, perhaps tortured, perhaps even executed. But they listen anyway, and then they hear it. A single line from a French poem tossed in amongst a hundred nonsense phrases disguised as personal messages. A cheer goes up, and the farmers grab their guns. That was their signal. The liberation starts tonight. This episode is sponsored by Wargaming. New players can download World of Tanks and use the code NEPTUNE for free goodies. Link in the description. Four years before the Normandy beach landings, the French government signed an armistice that turned all of northern France into a Nazi-occupied zone. They insisted that surrender was the only way to save their people from being crushed by the unstoppable German war machine. But from the first moment that German army boots marched down the streets of Paris, resistance groups began to spring up all over France. The early resistance groups were small, disorganized, and independent. They had enthusiasm, but no direction, other than a burning desire to kick the Germans out of their country. And there were not many of them. Most citizens chose to put their faith in what remained of the French government, which had fled south to the city of Vichy. Yeah, so this is obviously the Vichy French government, and Patan is, he kind of gets a, it's a, he has a, a blotchy, um, spotted, a historical past, right? When he's looked at, um, from a historical perspective, it's kind of, he he is known as a really really great military commander in World War One. Um, he is extremely famous for his his handling of World War One. Um, he's able to kind of salvage uh, French resistance in World War One when the the military is all but you know breaking down. In World War Two, it's it depends on which historian you read, on what viewpoint you get of Patan. Um, on one side, he's doing everything as cleverly as he can to try to sustain France um, and, you know, continue the French government in some way, shape, or form. And this was basically the only way that could happen. If you read the other side, it's he basically just rolled over and played dead. Um, I kind of, I, I empathize with the idea that like France lost, right? Germany steamrolled France. So I can empathize with the viewpoint that the only way the French government survives here is by essentially falling under German control. Um, so I, I have some empathy for him from the second world war, but it, it he is a, a, you know, kind of polarizing historical figure. They claimed to control unoccupied southern France, but they really they just did whatever the Germans told them to do. Yes. The early resistance lashed out by attempting to hurt or even kill German soldiers, but all they really managed to do was provoke vengeance. Hitler ordered the mass execution and deportation of several thousand French Jews and communists in retaliation for strikes made by the early resistance groups. The message was clear. If you hurt our people, we will hurt yours more. The resistance needed to find ways to fight back without inviting retribution and making things worse. And things had gotten pretty bad. By now, the German war machine, which had ground up the French armies in less than six weeks, had a desperate need for natural resources and industrial power. Two things that France had in abundance. They imposed tight rations on their French subjects and began redirecting all the wealth of France to fuel their conquering army. So that became the new resistance target. Take out the factories and the railroads so that the Germans couldn't use them anymore. As and this is smart by the resistance movement, but the Germans catch on to this very quickly, particularly with the manufacturing, right? Um, 
because it's not just resistance groups that are going in, you know, setting fire to a factory or something like that. It's people in the factory specifically like messing things up as they go through. Um, and so the Germans catch on obviously pretty quickly. And so the majority of German manufacturing, even once France falls, is done in Germany. Now, they get a lot of resources from France. They take a lot of manpower from France. There is a lot of things that they get from France. But they catch on to the sabotage of the manufacturing pretty quickly. And the majority of the manufacturing is done in German, Germany like proper. As long as they didn't harm any Germans doing it, the harshest reprisals never came. The British had that same idea. They parachuted agents into France to begin forming resistance networks of their own, recruiting citizens they could trust, and sometimes linking up with existing groups if they could find them. One of those agents would have a radio that could transmit messages back to London, requesting supply drops with weapons and explosives so that the resistance could get to work. But radios powerful enough to transmit across the channel were in pretty short supply. So they turned to Radio London, a public French-language station that had been created specifically to counter German propaganda and organize protests from safely across the English Channel. Radio London began to open and conclude every program with a nonsensical jumble of phrases that it called personal messages, which were actually coded messages for the resistance. The radio operators hiding in France would contact British headquarters with the requested supply drop and give them a random phrase, like, Pierre says hello. Then, instead of resistance members coming back to the safe house for updates every night, they could just listen at home on their radios. If Pierre said hello, they would head to their prearranged drop point. This radio system, the same one that would be used on D-Day to call the Normandy resistance cells to action, was operated by yet another group devoted to the liberation of France, the Free French. Back when the Germans had taken over northern France, a little-known general by the name of Charles de Gaulle escaped across the channel to England. Maybe this is just part of the deal with France in World War II because of their precarious situation. But Charles de Gaulle is also a historical figure that has a a spotted resume there are uh, a lot of people who think that he may have done the most or close to the most in helping keep the fire stoked for a free french there were a lot of leaders at the time specifically fdr who absolutely hated him thought he was dumb and okay so they thought he was dumb but not only that he was dumb but that he was the dumb guy who thought he was smart right and so it's it's it was like an arrogance of of intelligence that it oh my gosh it drove people uh, not everybody some people really liked him but it drove a lot of people mad at the time. He had been appointed to government office only 12 days before, but now found himself faced with the prospect of watching his country and the government he was supposed to serve surrender to Germany. De Gaulle would not have it. He got on the British radio and called for all of France to rise up and fight. He invited all the soldiers who had fled from the invading Germans to join him now in London to regroup and take their country back and he vowed to keep speaking on the radio so that those who couldn't leave France would know that the flame of French resistance still burned bright. Inspiring words, but very few people heard them. Most French people weren't exactly in the habit of listening to British radio broadcasts at this point, but those who did began to spread the word. Of 100,000 French soldiers who had escaped to Britain, 7,000 decided to stay with de Gaulle. It was small, but it was a start. And with that start, de Gaulle vowed to take France back from the Germans and the Vichy government that had surrendered to them. He knew that a small force couldn't accomplish that task on its own. He needed to win support from Great Britain and the United States, and he needed to coordinate the scattered groups of the French resistance. Both would prove very difficult. Winston Churchill recognized de Gaulle as the leader of the Free French Resistance Group, but he balked at acknowledging him to be the leader of France itself. 
After all, de Gaulle had never actually been elected leader of France, and now here he was trying to claim the right to lead a country that he couldn't even set foot in because its official government had sentenced him to death. To make matters worse, de Gaulle had a habit of rubbing President Roosevelt of the United States exactly the wrong way. But that same arrogance that drove Roosevelt away also proved to be the fire that de Gaulle had promised to keep burning for France. Pe okay, so... I don't want to be disparaging about the French Resistance or Charles de Gaulle, so I'm trying to pick my words very carefully here. Because there really were some great things done, and people sacrificed a lot to keep the idea of free France alive, right? Um, but the other major powers didn't really they didn't really bring into the fold the the French resistance government right like there were a bunch of of generals and countries that jumped on board sort of um the major powers really didn't until late in the game and by late in the game the whole thing was all of the winds had turned and France was going to be liberated, right? So the idea of treating France as if it was its own, you know, government and operation aside from German rule makes more sense when the whole game plan here is to free France, right? But earlier on when, you know, it is not as clear that France is about to be liberated, um, you know, they, they do as much as they can with de Gaulle and the quote unquote, like resistance government he sets up. But even till late in the game, the British and U S held some cards, even to do with France, very close to their chest. Piece by piece, he built a government in exile, appealing to both generals and bureaucrats to abandon the Vichy government and join his cause instead. Because of his determination to push himself forward as the true leader of France, he forced the Allies to treat France as an ongoing partner in the war effort, and not as a defunct and conquered nation like... Again, eh, eventually yes, but, you know... Uh, sort of, sort of. I mean, they were, I guess, involved in a, in a lot of stuff. But, I mean, in reality, France was very much treated like a conquered country for a, a good chunk of this war. So many others under the German thumb. By 1942, two years before the landings at Normandy, his efforts had begun to bear fruit. He had appointed a leader to coordinate the French resistance cells on his behalf, and succeeded in forming a central committee that pledged its loyalty to him. British agents began to coordinate their own resistance efforts with de Gaulle's Free French, although they didn't trust him entirely. They did keep a few of their networks secret from him. Nevertheless, they- Yeah, again, this is where de Gaulle really kind of does well. This is where he succeeds, is with the French resistance groups. But like I said, and, and like the video just said, the major powers held, you know, their cards pretty close to their chest for uh, the majority of this war when it came to the, the French government under Charles de Gaulle. They worked together to create a detailed set of plans to support the upcoming Allied invasion. They would target crucial railroads, telephone systems, and electrical installations to sabotage the Germans' ability to mobilize their defenses once the Allies landed. And that once small resistance movement had grown enormously over the four years of occupation. Now, over a hundred thousand combatants stood ready with weapons and explosives that had been parachuted in by drops coordinated through Radio London. The Allies and the Free French had pushed back on German control in the wider French Empire, winning massive victories in the French colonies of North Africa, and proving that a properly organized French army could indeed stand up to the German war machine. The Germans responded to that success by reaching for more control of France itself. They ended any pretense of the Vichy government's independence and overran the southern countryside, which only alienated more French people and bolstered recruitment for the resistance. 
But Germany's greatest gifts to the resistance were the invasion of Russia and the subsequent labor draft in France. When the Germans broke their uneasy truce with Russia, they galvanized the many communist groups in France to take up arms against them. These brand new resistance groups never entirely accepted the leadership of the Free French or the British agents, but they were well organized in their independence and made good use of the supplies those agents gave them. Meanwhile, to compensate for the men they had sent away to fight on the Eastern Front with Russia, Germany began to draft young Frenchmen to serve as forced labor in the cogs of their machine. Many fled the draft by running to the only group in France that would fight for their freedom, the Resistance. So when Resistance members gathered around their radios on June the 5th and finally heard the signal words that meant the liberation was on its way, they celebrated and then they got to work. In the span of a single day, they took down 577 railroads, 30 driving roads, and 32 telecommunication sites. They cut off several panzer divisions from moving north to join the German Defense Force, giving the Allies precious time to establish a beachhead before German reinforcements could arrive. And together with ordinary French citizens, many of whom now flooded to join the resistance in such numbers that the Allies didn't have enough weapons to supply them, they helped guide and support the paratroopers to strike key targets and begin dismantling German control of France. For all of the struggle, all of the setbacks, and yes, even the surrender that France faced, it was as de Gaulle predicted in that fateful radio address that first brought together the forces of the Free French. But has the last word been said? Must hope disappear? Is defeat final? No. Thanks. Okay, that was a good one. Extra Histories, D-Day from the French perspective. Um, I hope I wasn't too harsh in this video it's you know like i said i, I don't want to be disparaging about it they did some really great things and it was really kind of incredible that they were able to organize that type of resistance anyway um but just the way that that the french exile government was treated and the way that the vichy french government was treated as far as which one was legitimate and which one had any real French power and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, that was a good video. And uh, part four should be out tomorrow. Like, comment, subscribe. Uh, we just broke 400 subscribers. I appreciate all of the support on this. Help me keep building the channel over here. And I will see you all next time.